hi everyone uh, thank you for this uh, invitation i'm sorry i couldn't be there in person i would have loved to but uh, you know some uh, things kept me from that also thank you for almost what i see is one hour on the schedule so i'm going to interpret that as 45 minutes with 15 minutes for discussion and i'm going to now turn off my video so on the on the slide what you see is the lab at the surface of the ice at the south pole called the ice cube counting lab and this is an image that was taken maybe 4 or 5 years ago um let's um let's straight away get to it ice cube is about 1 cubic kilometer of ice naturally forming glacial ice at the south pole into which we drilled holes and we deployed photomultiplier tubes contained in pressure vessels along with uh, onboard el electronics and these these devices are then called digital optical modules and we have 5160 of these digital optical modules in the ice along 86 vertical strings um each uh, each string is about um seven uh, along each string these domes are placed about 70 meters apart and the domes are placed between a depth of 1.4 kilometers and 2.8 kilometers roughly um the array is um uh, the the main principle by which the detector operates is that we detect cherin uh, photons produced at cherenkov radiation which is um, uh, what happens when charged particles go through ice faster than light can go through ice now um uh, the 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 energy at which we are sensitive to neutrinos is roughly um, it scales with how how close you keep the detectors so most of the array uh, the 1 kilometer cube volume is sensitive to neutrinos above 100 gv but at the center of the array we have a region called deep core where we have eight strings that are placed um, much closer together so along each string the doms are uh, 17 meters apart as opposed to 70 meters along the other strings and also those uh, pmts have higher photo detection efficiencies so we are sensitive to neutrinos about 10 gv in this in the central part of the detector on the surface of the detector we have uh, so these these colored dots stand for uh, the 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 surface of uh, you know the projection of each string and on the surface uh, along with each string we have a station uh, uh, we have a tank of water in which we have these doms and uh, they sample directly the charged particles coming in uh, from uh, cosmic rays interacting with the upper atmosphere I'll tell you about and that's called ice top so you can think of ice top as a air shower array that's comparable to grapes 3 in uti or or uh, hawk in in new mexico um so uh, this is for example a picture that was taken uh, while the detector was being deployed the doms were placed along these cable assemblies and lowered into a hole that was drilled in the ice using hot water jets and our detector the most uh, the the main component of our detector here is the ice it is um, so if you want to if you measure the absorption length and the effective scattering length um, of ice as a function of the depth which we are able to do because we have uh, leds on each uh, digital optical module which can be flashed and then the arrival time of uh, photons at nearby digital optical modules can be tabulated and then you can fit that data to obtain the absorption and scattering lengths respectively um we we can that we construct different models of the ice uh, the measured lengths are shown here you will see that at the middle of the de uh, detector something like uh, 600 meters deep into the detector there is a region where both the absorption and scattering lengths become very small uh, that is the ice becomes not too transparent and also a very Uh, uh, a highly scattering medium and uh, that that is due to the fact that there is a layer of dust in the middle of our detector which is naturally occurring we believe it was created maybe 80000 years ago when uh, during an interglacial period volcanoes exploded and deposited a lot of dust into the uh, into the ice so if you were to fly into the south pole uh, this is where the amundsen scott south pole station is which is aligned with the geographic south pole and ice cube is just about 1.5 to 2 uh, kilometers off it 
Um, this is the outline of ice cube. It wouldn't be visible, but the counting lab itself is visible. Now, ice cube today is operated by a team of about 350 scientists. You'll see about 350 people on the other list. Majority of uh, about half of them are in, um, in North America and the uh, other half are in Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea. Since April 2021, TIFR has been a member of, uh, has been an associate member of IceCube. We are in the process of becoming full members. So in the near future, you may see India also in, in the lighter colors. Um, IceCube today, it's, you know, it's a, it's a large multi-purpose detector that's involved in various aspects of astroparticle physics. I will, in this talk, be talking about neutrino astronomy and astrophysics, so about detecting a diffuse astrophysical flux of neutrinos, searching for their sources, about carrying out correlation searches with other uh, detectors and also uh, uh, with data from other detectors and also a future planned extension for IceCube. I'll also be talking about uh, using IceCube to study the, pro the properties of the neutrino itself. So, so some particle uh, results that are relevant to particle physics. Um, there is uh, quite a bit of other science being done by IceCube, in particular, the surface array, which I called IceTop, uh, does uh, quite a bit of composition measurements, um, spectrum measurements, et cetera, for cosmic rays. Um, we try to measure neutrinos coming from the atmosphere of the sun. Um, we look for a lot of exotic particle physics phenomena from beyond the standard model. Because we are deep in the ice, we are able to measure properties of the ice that I told you about just now. And also we, we look for um, dark matter from various kinds of astrophysical sites where they could be annihilating and decaying. I will not be talking about um, any of this, um, but I have backup slides on it. If you want, you can ask. Um, you should view neutrino astronomy today within the context of multi-messenger astronomy, which, um, which of course, um, we had various discussions about yesterday. Um, the basic idea is that unlike just the visible spectrum, which we were confined to seeing in through more, which we were confined to observing the universe through throughout most of history, in the last 100 years or so, we've been able to build detectors that can go to higher energy photons and show us the non-thermal universe and lower energy photons, which have convinced us that the universe had a beginning, etc. We've also, for roughly around the same period of time, been seeing um, charged particles coming in from outer space. And that is one of the motivations for why we actually started trying to image the sky in neutrinos. And in the last 10 years, we have these two new messengers, gravitational waves and neutrinos. Um, um, the advantage of these different measure, uh, uh, these messengers for observing the universe can be plotted in this figure. On the x-axis, you will see the distance out to which you can image the universe. And on the y-axis, you will see the energy of the particle. And because we know that there is this diffuse uh, microwave background, uh, which we believe originates from the Big Bang, uh, we know that photons at energies of about 1 PeV or so cannot travel too far in the universe. They would interact with, the, with these background photons and pair produce and thus be attenuated. So at 1 PeV, the, the distance you can see out into the universe using photons is something like the distance to the center of our galaxy, not more. Uh, we cannot see out to cosmological scales. And uh, at higher energies, it does improve um, in the case of photons, but in, in the case of charged particles, which anyway do not carry much information because they're charged and there are magnetic fields in the, in the cosmos which deflect their trajectories, um, they still cannot travel too far because they also would uh, scatter off these background photons from the Big Bang and, um, uh, and produce uh, secondary particles, including neutrinos. Um, so these are the limitations of these messengers. However, the neutrino is in some sense the ideal messenger for the non-thermal universe because it's neutral, so it will not be deflected. It can point back. It interacts only weakly, which means that this, there is no curve like this for neutrinos in this figure. In fact, the entire universe is transparent to neutrinos, more or less, uh, with the only disadvantage being that the cross-sections being of the weak scale, uh, they are very hard to detect. So we need one kilometer cube size detector like IceCube to see a few neutrinos. 
And uh, the primary reason that Ice Cube was constructed and uh, why we pursue neutrino astronomy is given in this schematic. That is, for a long time, we've been measuring the fluxes and uh, composition uh, of cosmic rays across about 12 to 13 orders of magnitude in energy. And because they're charged, we don't know where they're coming from, but based on energetic considerations, it has long been believed that below the steepening of the spectrum, so up to a PEV energy also, they are all produced within our galaxy, possibly by supernova remnants, and beyond a PEV, so beyond the knee that they are mostly extragalactic, but these are all based on back of the envelope calculations. Um, there is no way to verify it by looking at cosmic ray themselves, because like I said, their arrival uh, uh, directions do not carry too much information about where they're coming from. What we could look for is, um, is signs of these particles being accelerated in these sources. And, um, um, and uh, so gamma rays would be a way to uh, detect these sources, um, but uh, they, um, they suffer from the fact that uh, if you see a source of high energy gamma rays, you do not know for sure if the gamma rays are produced from hadronic processes or electronic processes. So there is quite a bit of data analysis and, and subjectivity to it. Whereas unlike charged particles, the neutrinos, uh, they can be produced primarily only through hadronic processes and they manage to get out of um, uh, a lot of uh, material in between, which would attenuate gamma rays. So if you see TV or GV gamma rays, uh, sorry, neutrinos from a direction, uh, from a source in the sky, it's sort of a smoking gun signature that there is uh, there are cosmic rays being accelerated there. And so neutrinos can tell us where cosmic rays come from and that is why neutrino uh, ice cube was built. So if you trigger, if you uh, consider the different trigger windows in which ice cube is being read out, you will see two types of events. Um, so within these images, uh, which are event displays of ice cube, uh, the color stands for whether the photons were seen early within a trigger window or late within a trigger window with red being for early and blue with, for late. And the size you see corresponds to how much charge was de deposited within a photomultiplier tube. So this signature, you can clearly see, it looks like a track. There is a clear uh, direction you can see uh, reconstruct from it. And we believe this is from a muon. And if it is in the upgoing direction, we know for a fact that because muons cannot travel through the earth, um, uh, all the way through the earth, that it must have come from a charge current interaction of a muon neutrino. And um, the advantage is that if you reconstruct the direction of the secondary muon, that is a good proxy for the direction of the incoming neutrino to within, uh, well, at the highest of energies, less than 0 0.1 degree, sometimes 0 0.01 degree. So if you can reconstruct this to a good precision, this, these sort of events are a good vessel, for, uh, let's say a good uh, workhorse for neutrino astronomy, the way we say. So the disadvantage, of course, is that this interaction vertex uh, often does not, uh, in fact, it, it is both an advantage and a disadvantage. This interaction vertex does not have to be within the detector as long as we see the muon that is produced. So we have effectively a volume that is much larger than our instrumented volume for this channel of events. But on the other hand, we have no ability to tell its energy, only a lower limit in terms of how much energy was deposited within our detector can be said. Um, we also see other kinds of events. Here again, the color coding is the same. Red is for early within the trigger window, blue for late, and size is for charge. But as you can see, the distribution of uh, charge and timing within the trigger window is such that there is no obvious directionality to it. At the highest of energies, by um, exploiting our understanding of the ice, we are often able to reconstruct these events to about 15 degrees in angular resolution. So for, for those of you, I mean, for those of you who are astronomers, you can see that this is clearly not something we would like to uh, use for astronomy. And uh, the advantage of course, is that if most of this cascade is within our detector, then our detector is a fully active calorimeter. So um, all, flavor, all flavors of neutrinos interacting um, by the neutral current interaction, which is mediated by the Z boson, and also electron and tau neutrinos interacting by the charge current interaction will produce a signature like this. It's either an electromagnetic cascade or a hadronic cascade, but our detector is not 
uh, granule, it's not finely uh, instrumented enough for us to be able to tell the two apart. Um, this, uh, in both cases, unlike the India-based neutrino observatory, which has a magnetic field inside it, and so can tell, can make the muon curve, and then based on the curvature, tell you the charge of the uh, of the muon, and thus whether the primary particle was a neutrino or an anti-neutrino. In both these cases, Ice Cube is not really able to tell you whether it was a neutrino or anti-neutrino, except in the case of one um, uh, very small exception that I'll tell you later. So just to just to highlight, this is the kind of events that lead to tracks. They're mediated by w, w boson. They're called charge current interactions, and the outgoing lepton is a muon. The same interaction in which the outgoing lepton is an electron or a tau leads to a cascade, as well as neutral current interactions where the outgoing lepton is a is a neutrino itself, and uh, there is um, uh, a cascade. Now, if you were to look at the track-like events distributed uh, that are seen by Ice Cube and uh, look at their distribution in the direction in the sky, um, you would see a distribution like this. In the northern sky, which is the upgoing region, because we are at the south, uh, we are at the south pole, um, you would see uh, just a flux of events of track-like events going up, which we believe originates from neutrinos. Uh, interacting uh, either within the ice or within the bedrock right below the ice. And those neutrinos, the vast majority of them are produced directly in interactions of cosmic rays with the upper atmosphere. Um, on the other hand, in the downgoing region, which is the southern sky, when you're standing at the South Pole, you have a, a background similar, a similar background that is six orders of magnitude higher in rate. And that is by muons that are directly produced in the upper atmosphere. So in the, in the northern sky, um, uh, the, the source is muons produced from neutrino interactions. In the southern sky, uh, these are muons that are directly produced in the upper atmosphere and travel all the way from the upper atmosphere to your detector. And so we see about 70 billion of those per year, whereas the muons produced from atmospheric neutrinos, we see only about 80,000 per year. And buried beneath both these backgrounds, you have today a signal of neutrinos at roughly about 10 per year, which we have detected. And detecting that uh, was one of our major results in 2013. It uh, was on the cover of science. And um, how we did that analysis is, is quite interesting. We looked only at trigger windows where a large amount of charge, so about 6,500 photoelectrons of charge, had been deposited within our detector. And then we use the outermost layer of the detector as a veto. So we made sure that we are not looking at events coming in from outside our detector or uh, secondaries produced from interactions happening outside our detector. We are confining ourselves to really neutrino uh, interacts, interacting with nucleons in the ice, but the interaction vertex happens within our detector. That is how, uh, and, and we also were looking at the highest energy of those. And once we did those, uh, once we applied those two cuts, we got a distribution of events, which can be seen in this figure um, with respect to energy. And um, based on the best theoretical predictions of how many atmospheric neutrinos and atmospheric muons are there, are supposed to be there, uh, convolved with Monte Carlo's of our detector, uh, Monte Carlo simulations of our detector, we see a clear excess on top of both those background expectations. Um, and to fit the data, you have to in invoke an astrophysical component, that is neutrinos that are directly coming in from outer space. And they are, uh, for, to first approximation, they're distributed isotropically. Now, if you, if you plot their directions in the sky and, and you do a likelihood analysis for clustering, you see that um, you don't, um, uh, I mean, you may see some hotspots which suggest that you see a significant clustering in some direction, but you're also carrying out this likelihood analysis at every point in the sky on a grid. And once you account for that look elsewhere effect, there is no statistically significant clustering. So this is not statistically significant. The arrival distribution, the arrival direction distribution of these events is consistent with isotropy. Uh, and the, the main reason for that is that the majority of these events, at least three, uh, three out of every four events are cascades. So they have angular resolutions of 15 or 20 degrees or worse and not tracks which have angular resolutions less than a degree. Just to make it explicit how we identified these events, 
Um, we have plotted uh, the, uh, the charge deposited by ice cube um, in, uh, in uh, sorry, charge deposited by each event within the ice cube detector um, along two axes. Um, this is the total charge within the detector and this is the charge within the outermost layer. So you're looking at the highest uh, end of this along this axis and the lowest end along this axis and you apply this cut and these are your events of interest. Now, we saw, we confirmed the presence of this astrophysical flux of neutrinos today with uh, eight more than, uh, with more than seven and a half years of data public and we have 10 years of data which we are analyzing internally at way more than six sigma. But we have also confirmed the same flux um, uh, in many other channels. So not just in contained events, but also through going tracks. So in an independent sample of events in which we did not uh, use the outermost layer of the detector as a veto and we look primarily at tracks, there again, you see a flux uh, excess at the highest of energies, which cannot be explained by any of the known backgrounds. In non-contained cascades, six years of data, again, you see an excess at the highest of energies, which cannot be explained by any of the ba uh, known backgrounds. And um, you can fit a spectral index to each of these individual fluxes and a normalization. And uh, on that, uh, in this parameter space, you see that all of these analyses is, are compatible to each other within two sigma or so. There was a brief period earlier where there was something like 2.5 sigma tension, between some of these channels, but as more data came in, the tensions have reduced and all, all channels are compatible with each other. We are, seeing an, uh, uh, we are seeing an isotropic flux of neutrino with roughly this normalization and um, a spectral index between two and three. So 2.5 to, to three. This is the diffuse uh, uh, flux of neutrinos we are seeing. Now, um, as I showed you, if you just plot their directions in the sky, we don't uh, really see any obvious sign that they're coming from a particular source or that they're clustered around any specific direction in the sky. So starting in 2016, what we did was we started trying to alert the community as soon as we see one of these events. So when we first detected these events to reconstruct them, to infer the direction of the incoming neutrino, the energy of the incoming neutrino from the distribution of photons we see within our detector um, involved algorithms that would take days to run on a computer. And um, uh, we decided to make a real-time alert system. We had to speed up much of these algorithms and I was quite uh, involved in that process. Um, and uh, thanks to the use of uh, splines and, and a multi-step method, wherein you initially come up with a very coarse estimate for the direction and energy, and then you follow up later with a more accurate estimate. We have been able to, since 2017 beginning, uh, send out alerts within sometimes with within 17 seconds of the detector being triggered. And these alerts go out into astronomers telegrams, gamma ray coordinate networks, and also something called the astrophysical multi-messenger observatory network, which is a real-time data sharing agreement. And uh, they go out to different uh, telescopes, which have, um, which have subscribed to our alert stream. And since 2016, we have been um, sending these alerts. And so far, there have been 60 alerts. Also. In 2017, September, I think this was uh, the 11th or 10th alert we were sending out. Um, uh, the first nine or 10 alerts we sent out and nothing particularly interesting happened. But um, we sent out an alert in 2017, September, and within three or four days, we found um, a sequence of astronomers telegrams um, and GCNs from other uh, telescopes, per, per mainly MAGIC the Imaging Atmospheric Cherenkov Telescope, um, and also Fermi, the Space-Based Gamma Ray Telescope, saying that they see a blazar, which is within the contour of our direct, uh, the directional reconstruction of the single event, which had deposited about 290 TV within our detector. And they found that this blazer was in a state of heightened gamma ray activity. It was emitting about 10 times as, as many gamma rays as usual, at both TV and GV energies compared to what you would expect on of its you know, average, uh, long-term time average. And so um, this is, I forget what constellation this is, but the source is right below its arm. And if you, if you uh, look at the contours, you can see the ice cube 50% contour here gray in gray. 
and um, and uh, in red you will see the 90% contour and here already you can get a idea of how good neutrino astronomy is compared to other uh, other messengers it's not it's fundamentally limited by the the kinematic angle between the incoming neutrino and muon so we we can never hope to have the angular resolution that magic or fermi does but the angular resolution nevertheless is good enough for example to tell us that it did not come from this source which is another blazar that was within you know it is somewhat close to this event but because our contour is here we know it didn't come from this source now um, so we we um, at the time of sending out this alert uh, we had already sent out nine or 10 alerts and had uh, there were different you know follow up campaigns which was really um, not uh, in an automated way it was human beings looking at these alerts and deciding whether to point their telescopes in those directions in different directions and uh, we were not sure if this was um, if if this was actually statistically significant so a long series of exercises were undertaken to evaluate if uh, accounting for the look elsewhere effect of all the alerts sent out so far etc uh, they, they these are uh, this is possibly a statistical fluctuation and after the most conservative methods of uh, statistical methods were employed we still believe that this was statistically significant at about 3 sigma level which if you are a particle physicist you know is not really something to be excited by but that gives us some reason to think of this direction in the sky corresponding to the source as special so we kind of went back um, uh, we went back and looked at our archival data in that direction and did a time dependent likelihood analysis and in this case because we have no reason to privilege um, other directions in the sky to the extent we are privileging this direction there is no look elsewhere effect and in this analysis we see a 3.5 sigma excess between 2014 and 2015 uh, an excess of 13 events compared to the background and um, this is also a time dependent signal uh, here you can see that its uh, spectral index is about uh 2.2 so it's quite a, a hard spectrum that is there is relatively more events at higher energies and um uh, the the key thing to realize is that this was a standalone this was an analysis of our uh, archival data and in this period there is no other multi messenger counterpart or uh, there is no enhanced gamma ray emission from the source Uh, or uh, it, 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 uh, at least it has not been detected. Uh, some, uh, for example, the source was within the field of view of Fermi, uh, of Integral, and some IACTs were pointed at them, and there are upper limits, and their the upper limits are are higher than they were in the two thousand seventeen period. So um, uh, these two separate analyses, which do not have uh, the same. a uh, signal hypothesis and thus cannot be combined to produce you know one phi sigma uh, one analysis looks for the probability that a gamma ray uh, enhanced activity as seen in iacts and fermi is correlated with a single neutrino event and the other analysis uh, shows a time dependent clustering uh, in the same direction but with no corresponding um, enhanced flux in any other messengers both independently give slightly about 3 sigma 3 to 3.5 sigma uh, confidence that um this is um uh, one of our this is the first extra galactic source of tv neutrinos um at the time of this identification there were many questions so why is for example so at the time we saw this uh, this uh, this even from this blazer its redshift was not known Uh, but the excitement created by these follow-up efforts uh, led to uh, people pointing a spectrograph in the direction and measuring its redshift, and it turned out to be a redshift of 0.3, slightly higher than 0.3, 0.33 or something, which you can which you which you can see is uh, clearly cosmological. It's uh, very far away, four billion light years or so. So um, the first question is why is it? Uh, and we see objects uh, that are blazers, which are active galactic nuclei with their jets pointing towards us. um many of them which are much closer than this 4 billion light years so one of the first questions that rose was why is why are not the why do we not see a comparable neutrino emission from the closer blazers and this question has is at least not that big a puzzle anymore because we do see one more source and so um uh, 
you know, Blazers became a very exciting candidate to uh, as as potential sources of uh, high energy neutrinos. Um, so this is what you think of as a multi messenger spectral energy distribution. All the, the photon data is tabulated here, and the neutrino data of the single event, depending upon what period of the detector you consider, is also tabulated here. Um, uh, we have looked for um, correlations between these high energy neutrinos within our contained sample of, uh, of uh, tracks and cascades and, for example, ultra high energy cosmic rays seen by Pierre Auger Observatory and Telescope Array. And uh, we do not see any statistically significant correlation. They appear to be completely uncorrelated with each other. And uh, that is not uh, surprising because, like I said, the, the ultra energy cosmic rays can travel a few hundred megaparsecs at best due to their interaction with background photons, whereas neutrino horizon is essentially uh, infinite. So we do not expect any correlation at, the, at more than a percentage level between these two messengers. We have looked for neutrinos coming directly from these um, neutrinos produced directly from these pion decays in these interactions. With, uh, because of ultra energy cosmic rays interacting with background photons. Um, the optimistic models predict a flux that is above our sensitivity, but we have not detected anything. And what this suggests is that the optimistic models are not true and the optimistic models are based on the assumption that the highest energy cosmic rays are all um, uh, protons. And we have multiple independent lines of evidence slowly starting to suggest that the uh, highest energy cosmic rays are not, uh, not likely to be protons. Um, in fact, they are dominated by heavier nuclei. Um, uh, of particular in interest to you um, might be the fact that we have also been looking for correlations between these high energy events we see and, and also uh, high energy events in different channels within our detector with um, gravitational waves. Um, so every time uh, the LIGO Virgo collaboration uh, sends out a gravitational wave alert, we carry out a fast follow up analysis, look, seeing if one of our events happened to be coincident with them. So far, there has been no coincidence. Even in the case of the, um, of the neutron star, neutron star merger, we had an electromagnetic counterpart even though the paper was published saying it was the first event that was observed from all uh, five continents and, and we were one of the detectors in, the, uh, at, in Antarctica that was technically looking for this. We saw no events. We have only an upper limit and that is um, uh, current models of, of this neutron star, neutron star merger or uh, current observations of it uh, show that the jet that was produced as a result of that event was not pointed towards us. It was, uh, I think, between 11 and 17 degrees or so pointed away, fr uh, 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 away from the line of sight. If it was within less than um, four degrees, perhaps it was, uh, it, Ice Cube would have been sensitive to it, depending upon uh, different models, but it was not uh, aligned that closely. And as a result, uh, the Ice Cube upper limits are much higher than the model predictions. Uh, but in the future, if similar events keep happening, and luckily uh, one of the jets happened to be aligned with our detector, we have a reasonable chance of seeing them. We, um, but yeah, we have been carrying out correlation analyses with all the different gravitational wave uh, events that get announced. And you can see the, the banana plots in the sky corresponding to each of the gravitational waves. And in green, you can see the neutrinos, and you can see that there is no directional correlation. The neutrinos we see within the same time window, which are at the highest of energies and have a high likelihood of being, um, being uh, astrophysical are nevertheless not directionally correlated with the gravitational waves. So um, um, now, now I'll talk about um, the search for point sources of neutrinos, uh, which was originally the kind of analysis that we were carrying out um, before we used this veto-based analysis which detected the diffuse flux of, uh, of neutrinos. So uh, this was the kind of analysis that was conceived of IceCube doing uh, when IceCube was designed. And the idea is that you don't use a veto, you don't have an energy threshold either, but you look only for things which are clearly tracks within your detector. 
So uh, if you isolate only tracks, you get a sample which in the northern sky is dominated by muons produced from atmospheric neutrinos and in the southern sky is dominated by atmospheric muons directly. And those are expected to be distributed uniformly within each declination band. But any point source neutrinos coming from outer space, um, so any, uh, any neutrinos coming from a point source in outer space, they should be directionally clustered. So if you carry out a likelihood analysis looking for statistically significant clustering within these randomly distributed samples of tracks, uh, and if you detect statistically significant clustering, you can think of it as a detection of a point source. Another ingredient uh, property of each event that can help in this is that most um, theoretical understanding of how neutrinos are emitted and how charged particles are accelerated in sources predict that uh, neutrinos coming directly from outer space should have a harder spectrum. That is, there should be relatively more at higher energy than uh, lower energies compared to, for example, the atmospheric neutrino and muon backgrounds. And the objective of this is to find the signal that's buried here. It's the lower energy neutrinos we are looking for, the signal at the highest of energies has, uh, which is diffuse and in which finding point sources require uh, multi-messenger correlations have, have already been explored in the previous analysis that I told you about. And with this sample of events, as you can see, uh, you get, so, okay, I'm using the same plot twice. I'm sorry about this. Um, the angular resolution gets as good as about 0 0.25 degrees at the highest of energies. Uh, and there are about 600,000 tracks in about seven years of data, which are now public in which you can access and analyze yourself. And so we, we took one of these samples of data. Um, this is with our internal latest 10 years of data and we carried out an analysis. So what this analysis does is it looks at each point in the sky on a grid of 0 0.1 degree by 0 0.1 degree and maximizes a point source likelihood, um, looking for statistically significant clustering. And um, using Wilkes theorem, we can quantify the p-value of um, uh, by which each point is not compatible with the background only hypothesis. And you see these very small p-values in the northern sky and southern sky at the hottest of spots, which would suggest that we have found point sources. But uh, the issue is that there is a large look elsewhere effect um, corresponding to, or which is called a trial factor, depending upon whether you are a Bayesian or frequentist, uh, which is associated with the fact that you have looked every at every point in the sky. So there is a large uh, penalty that you have to impose upon yourself because you're doing a large number of trials. And once you impose that penalty for yourself, so once you ask uh, in, in random skies, how often am I likely to see the hottest spot hotter than what we have observed so far, once you account for those trials, the p-values are about 0 0.75 and 0 0.1 roughly. And as you can see, those are large enough values or p-values and they're not statistically significant. So a simple uh, analysis of the sky that, that we originally thought of for ice cube to do uh, to this day, because of the large look elsewhere effect associated with scanning every point in the sky does not give us a statistically significant detection of a source. But um, we don't, we have no reason to privilege every point in the sky uh, equally other than in our perhaps our most democratic analysis. We know from, uh, from gamma ray astronomy, um, especially from IACTs, that uh, a very large number of sources in the sky emit high energy uh, gamma rays and they are more likely to also emit neutrinos. So we can look in uh, promising directions in the sky as identified by other observatories. And if you do that with the same analysis I showed you earlier, you are, redu you, you are basically reducing your total um, trial factor by uh, to just 120. So if you look at just 120 promising sources, for example. So you, you first construct a catalog based on TV and GV gamma ray emitters, um, based on some principles that uh, you believe make them promising neutrino candidates, and then you carry out the search only in those directions. And if you do that, um, you see a few hotspots in the northern sky. And even after you account for the 120 trials associated with looking in 120 directions in the sky, one of these hotspots is still um, statistically significant at about 4.2 sigma, which is uh, quite exciting for us astroparticle physicists, though it's still not at the five sigma threshold. And if you look at the distribution of events from that direction, what you will see is that uh, if it was just background, the, the distribution of events um, at, at different angles from that, the direction of that source should have been 
should have been this orange, but you see a clear axis from the direction of that source. And that is NGC1068. Now, if you look at the normalization of this flux and the spectral index here, you will see that the source is very soft. Its, um, its spectrum is something like E raised to minus 3.3, uh, 3.2, so it's, uh, um, it's, uh, it has relatively more neutrinos at lower energies compared to higher energies. So uh, this, for example, is once again a multi-messenger SCD of, of this source, NGC1068. Um, yeah, a few things need to be said. The source NGC1068, unlike the TXS source I told you earlier, is much closer. I think it's within, within 30 megaparsecs or so. So it's uh, really within our um, uh, local cosmic neighborhood. Um, and um, MAGIC, the, the Imaging Atmospheric Cherenkov Telescope, had already measured the neutrino flux from the source. And, sorry, uh, sorry, not the neutrino flux, the gamma ray flux from the source. And uh, based on the gamma ray flux and based on the kind of physics that goes into models um, uh, that are used to explain multi-messenger data, they had predicted that the neutrino flux from the source would be uh, about a factor of 100 smaller than what we eventually ended up measuring. So that, that should be a, a cautionary tale against some of the theoretical calculations that are being done in this field. And the reason, of course, is that, um, I mean, the reason that is now being said is that uh, the reason the neutrino flux turned out to be much larger than the gamma ray flux is that the source is dust obscured. So there are gamma rays being produced, but they're being attenuated by a dust that's between our detector and where the gamma rays are being produced. And as a result, the gamma ray flux is suppressed, but the neutrino flux turned out to be much larger than expected because of that. So, um, so yeah, uh, every time we produce an, a flux measurement uh, for any source, you will occasionally find models um, uh, such as this one uh, by Murase, which claim to overlap with our flux measurement and, and thus explain the data. But if you, if you look at, uh, you know, the number of parameters involved in these models, what kind of physical assumptions make, they make, I'm not really sure what is the point of this kind of modeling. They, they, one can always fit data, but you don't really seem to be learning much from the process. This is the flux that has been um, uh, measured, the diffuse astrophysical flux. These are the two sources. This is the source that we uh, that I told you about earlier, the the blazar at cosmological distance, and this is the nearby uh, dust obscured blazar. And as you can see, both these sources together contribute a flux that is about 10% of the total diffuse flux or so. The remaining 90%, the sources responsible for that, uh, still remain to be uh, discovered. Um, with these um, track dominated events, we have carried out um, searches, stacking searches. For, for example, Fritz Zwicky has had an argument, you know, going back a hundred years that, that uh, supernovae provide most of the energy for galactic cosmic rays. And then Fermi came up with a mechanism for how the, how the, the shells um, of these supernovae, the shocks at those shells can accelerate cosmic rays. So for a long time, um, we believed, I mean, we still believe that galactic um, supernova remnants are great uh, sites for cosmic ray acceleration. We have carried out stacking searches looking for them, uh, but so far we have not found any, um, any uh, statistically significant clustering or even excess from directions of different known supernova remnants in the sky. Uh, even when you add them up, there are some very weak hints for example, from supernova remnants in the Cygnus region of the galaxy. But the main reason is that much of the galaxy is in the southern sky for Ice Cube, where, you know, because of this muon, uh, muon um, background, our sensitivity is not as good as, uh, as, the, as in the northern sky. Um, uh, a neutrino telescope really looks be uh, is, is, is best when it is looking through the Earth. The Earth can kind of black block out all the atmospheric muons, and then you only have the irreducible background of atmospheric neutrinos to worry about. So um, the fact that we have not seen any excess from supernova remnants allows us to set constraints on very optimistic models. Some of the more optimistic models have been completely excluded and the, the, some of the more pessimistic models are going to be within our sensitivity range in the next five or six years. So this is quite promising, but I think uh, we should look out for analysis from Northern Hemisphere neutrino telescopes like KM3Net or or the proposed Pacific Ocean neutrino experiment or any of these upcoming ones. Um, we
we have looked for um, a, a flux of neutrinos from the galactic disk, the galactic diffuse component, which follows, um, uh, for example, the Fermi pion decay map. Um, and we have once again not uh, detected any statistically significant excess from the direction uh, of the galactic disk that follows this template. Um, and uh, in fact, realistic models of, of neutrino flux production from the galactic diffuse, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the realistic models of diffuse galactic um, cosmic rays uh, are uh, anyway beneath our sensitivity. We have looked for correlations with gamma ray bursts, but uh, with six or seven years of data. And uh, the most um, optimistic models of how gamma ray bursts accelerate cosmic rays are now excluded because of the fact that we see no correlations. And uh, this rules out gamma ray bursts as the dominant sources of ultra energy cosmic rays. Um, we have looked for um, correlations between subthreshold warm spots we see within our detector, that is, uh, uh, in the point source search po points in the sky where you see something like a two to three sigma axis. And we have looked for correlations with local structure of matter. And we don't see any axis there, but um, unless if uh, with promising source candidates like low luminosity AGNs or starburst galaxies, this is expected to give us a correlation only with the next generation ice cube detector. Um, I see that I'm already on 45 minutes, so I'm going to skip the particle physics part of this talk because, you know, uh, this is also a neutron star conference, so I don't think it is of interest to you. Um, I will just skip directly to the summary, which is that IceCube has discovered a diffuse flux of high-energy astrophysical neutrinos, and neutrino astronomy is at a stage comparable to what gamma ray astronomy was in the 70s. What I mean is we have a diffuse flux, we have a few sources. Um, our sensitivity to point sources now will improve only as one by square root of T. We have already been running for about 10 years since 2000 or so 12 years now since 2011 to 2023. And uh, so if we run for 24 years, that is next 12 years, our sensitivity will just improve by maybe 40%. So if you want to image the sky in neutrinos properly, we need a much bigger detector. And for that, we have envisioned what is called the ice cube gen two detector. So if you, that is basically going to be the, this blue region, the red region is the existing ice cube, ice cube detector. And um, the green region is the deep core infill. So you ice cube will be to ice cube gen two, what deep core is to ice cube. And um, we are going to make a detector that is about 10 times the uh, instrumented volume of ice cube without um, uh, making it 10 times as expensive by just placing these digital optical modules in the eyes further apart and also putting more strings. So instead of 86 strings, we'll have 120 new strings. We'll have 80 DOMs per string and uh, the detector is going to have about 10 times the uh, volume of ice cube. The threshold will be larger. It will be about, instead of 100 GV, about 10 TV. But that's okay because all the astrophysical neutrinos uh, we have seen are about 10 TeV or so. Um, and uh, for the first time, this detector will also have a large um, radio uh, array component. So just like Cherenkov radiation is produced by these interactions, they also produce uh, radio between 100 uh, megahertz and 500 megahertz, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that can be detected using a phased array, about 200 stations, which was tried out. This technique has been, that it can work, has been validated by something called Ascarian radio array. So if this is what is Gen 2, Gen 2 is going to be a small, uh, Gen 2 optical array is going to be a small part of a much bigger array of about 200 hybrid radio stations, which will have antenna deployed into the eyes like this. And that, so yeah, Ice Cube Gen 2 is going to be an optical radio uh, optical plus radio array with stations like this. And the surface array of ice cube, which I called ice top, will also have scintillator-based detectors that will serve as a that will serve as a proxy for uh, for the in-ice uh, array. And we can in principle extend it uh, for as large a solid angle as possible and try to get a, a, a veto um, to over the uh, as large a solid angle of the sky as possible. So this is something uh, we we are we are exploring from the TIFR side. Um, my postdoc Manisha has already been working on it, 
the cables uh, required for ice cube gen 2 are um, uh, there is we may be building those in india these are cables that are 3 kilometers deep and will have to survive for hundreds of years at the going all the way to the bottom of the ice where the temperature will be minus 70 degrees and and uh, pressure will be as high as 700 bar so these are some very special cables we'll have to make um, and also, um, Ice Cube Gen 2 will have very different types of optical modules. Um, these include, for example, um, so for the Ice Cube, the optical module had a single photomultiplier tube that was pointing downwards. For Ice Cube Gen 2, we'll have optical modules with either two photomultiplier tubes pointing in both directions or 24 photo photomultiplier tubes within a dome, which, are, which have smaller photocathode area. And the point is that you are not only just sensitive to the fact that an optical module has seen photons, you're also sensitive in which direction that photon came from, which can be useful information for reconstruction. So those, um, those ideas are being explored. And I think I will stop my talk now since there are only 10 minutes left for discussion. Um, this is, yeah, that, yeah that's it. Uh, we have done some astronomy with neutrinos and we need a bigger detector to continue to do better astronomy with neutrinos. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Ramiz, for a very nice talk. And let me just add that Ice Cube has made all this data publicly available. It's one of the very few or maybe the only high energy physics experiment which has done it. So any of you can analyze the data and, and so on and so forth. So I open the floor to questions. So uh, any questions? Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, can we uh, can this ice cube detector be uh, used as a particle detector, which can detect uh, other particles? Sure. So uh, there are yeah, um, uh, ice cube is very much a particle detector. In fact, uh, you know. Uh, so for example, uh, just to give you one example of some papers you'll find if you you know go on spires and search for papers written by ice cube, is that. Uh, Wow, I seem to have a lot of slides. Let me just scroll back um, to the, you know, I, I showed you these, yeah. So uh, you can look, for example, in some um, supersymmetric scenarios, there are predictions of what is called a trident. So you will have one vertex and then three tracks coming out of it uh, due to three muons that are produced simultaneously. You can look for those. We have so far not seen any. There is also a standard model expectation for it, uh, but that is extremely small in the sense for a detector our size, it's uh, you, you should never see, see it on human time scales. And uh, searching for such events have allowed us to set constraints on, on you know, uh, operators corresponding to that in SUSI. Uh, we have some triggers which, are not, which don't look at less than, um, uh, you know, a microsecond time scales, but look, um, for, for example, magnetic monopoles. So if magnetic monopoles go through our detector, they will lead to like uh, a prolonged period of, of uh, well, they'll, they'll cause this uh, uh, proton decay. The, this is one of the hypotheses. We have looked for that. We have not seen magnetic monopoles. So we have stringent limits on magnetic monopoles. Um, we have a whole bunch of dark matter searches, basically the same way gamma ray telescopes look for dark matter by looking at different targets in the sky which could be um, promising um, sources where dark matter is annihilating. We look for neutrinos from the same direction. We don't see anything. We set constraints on neutrinos also. Uh, sorry, we set constraints on the dark matter annihilation, uh, you know, thermally average annihilation cross-section. Um, uh, yeah, Ice Cube has a wide array of uh, other searches for other particles. We have recently, for example, detected the tau neutrino, which I did not speak about again because um, I, I had actually some slides on it because I thought it'll take me 15 minutes to get there, but uh, the, uh, I, I kind of distinguish between the neutrino astronomy and the particle physics side of it because they are of interest to different communities. But uh, in principle, if you have an understanding of our triggers, which are very simple compared to any LHC detector, and you have an understanding of particle physics, you can set limits on almost any kind of interactions with our detector. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, the radio antennas that you have talked about, Yes. Uh, are they placed above the surface or uh, inside the ice or what is the kind of mechanism? So they go, um, they go about hundred meters into the ice, right? So yeah, these are the, these were the particle physics slides. We have seen, for example, the glass show resonance, just uh, 
I'm sorry, just answering your previous question in a little bit more detail. This is a particle physics process that, you know, you will never be able to create a neutrino beam on Earth to verify that it exists, but we are about 100 is to 1 odds confidence that it exists. We have confirmed the standard model prediction for the neutrino and nucleon cross-section. So there's quite a bit of circular logic involved in that. We have confirmed the standard model prediction for what is called inelasticity. In each interaction, how much energy goes into. But yeah, let's get to the radio question that you asked. Um, these detectors are placed about 100 meters. So you place them at the surface and as well as the, uh, the electronics and the readouts, et cetera. And then you place the dipole antennas uh, along strings um, about 100 meters into the ice. These contain dipole antennas, which have both horizontal, which are oriented in such a way they're sensitive to both horizontal polarization and vertical polarization. And the reason for that is when these interactions happen in ice, the radio, you will get both the direct radio emission and also the radio emission that's reflected off the top surface of, uh, of the ice. And once it gets reflected, the, the polarization uh, gets rotated. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I know very little about radio detectors or astronomy, but that is how I understand it. And how these radio uh, uh, emission is produced itself, it's called the Ascarian effect. Um, so you can think of it sort of like the radio equivalent of the Cherenkov effect, but there's also the fact that the, sh the shower that's produced in the ice, uh, it has an excess of negative charge and, uh, and, and less of positive charge because the positrons will annihilate uh, much faster than the electrons in those um, showers. So yeah, there's quite a bit of, but um, yeah, uh, just as a, just to also mention the existing array, which is the prototype based on which this is going to be deployed, the Ascarian radio array. They've only operated about, I think, 20 of these stations or, or maybe less than that. I, I don't know the details. And they have so far not seen any promising neutrino events, but all technology has been validated and we are hopeful that, you know, the radio array will give us useful information, especially when used in conjunction with the optical array. That, okay. That's how we are looking at it right now. Yeah, one more small question. Uh, how are the sensitivities uh, compared to all uh, these different methods? Are they are equally sensitive or uh, one is much preferred than other? Okay, I may have a backup slide on it, uh, but um, if, if not, I'm, I'm going to keep answering any. Uh, so uh, radio, the method is really like you get a radio pulse that is sensitive enough, that is strong enough for us to start inferring neutrino properties only if the neutrino energy is above a few PeV. Whereas, like I said, Ice Cube is, sorry, I don't have the backup slide on it, but mm -hmm. Ice Cube is sensitive to neutrinos above 100, uh, about 10 GeV if you go down to deep core, 100 GeV if you go down to, uh, if you consider the rest of the array. And then because the flux is steeply falling off, we have seen events as high. The highest energy events you have seen are a few PeV in energy. And that few PEV happens to be the lowest energy at which the radio array can, can operate. So we have like a few, one decade of energy where the two arrays will overlap in energy, but beyond that, the optical array is not expected to have sufficient sensitivity. Gen 2 optical array will go up to maybe 50 PEV or so in energy because the flux is even lower, but our effective volume is larger. But the radio array's sensitivity starts at that point. They are like different parts of a spectrum. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they sample different parts of the spectrum. Yeah, so thank you. Okay, Mara. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the radio gives you. Like, can you get better localization, um, better measurements of like what specific properties? Um, so, like I said, it's in a it's in an energy range much higher than optical, and is much cheaper to build. So that is one of the reasons we are putting in. Uh, the other thing is that it. Uh, with a very sparsely instrumented optical array, we may not be able to localize the vertex that accurately. It really depends on how well we model the ice. So Ice Cube keeps improving our understanding of the ice. And so all our detector properties have been slowly getting better as we do better calibration. But we are hopeful that the radio, apart from just extending our energy range for cheaper to much above PV energies, will also give us better um, resolution for the for the you know interaction vertex etc. 
I'll just add in I think in US the, the such a search has also been done with the Goldstone array. Uh, I think someone from UCLA had led that. I think maybe about fifteen years ago. There's also the Anita experiment. I also right, which does which looks or something similar. And just to answer Avinash's question, right? I think many of these muon detected. I mean. Ice cube detects cosmic ray muons also. So you can do things like sidereal anisotropies, Compton getting effect. And I think many of the previous detectors also found the shadow of the moon, the fact that moon blocks some of the cosmic rays. I, I think Ice Cube has done something like that, right? Yeah, so we use that to validate our pointing. All of our Monte Carlo studies can only, you know, uh, yeah, this is the moon shadow analysis. Um, all of our Monte Carlo analysis can only tell us how good our relative pointing is. To be sure, our, our absolute pointing is, you know, uh, is is good. We look and make sure that we are seeing the moon where it's supposed to be with the kind of deflections we are supposed to be seeing. Um, um, yeah, I. So yeah, we saw the moon shadow within our detector. It's a standard practice for all air shower arrays or things that are uh, that are sensitive to secondaries produced in air showers to make sure you're seeing the moon shadow. Um, as a way of validating your pointing. Any other questions? Yeah, Neil. Uh, so, uh, how is Ice Cube Gen two going to work with the cubic um, kilometer tel uh, telescope coming up in Europe? I mean, it's not going to. We are going to have a real time alert system, which is not really relevant because, like I said, Ice Cube is the Earth is essentially transparent to neutrinos at above PeV energy, so. You don't need to point your detector. You don't need to change trigger conditions, nothing. You just you can just keep operating. But uh, already the smaller version of KM3Net called Antares, we have combined our two detectors and done point source analysis. But Antares has only a instrumented volume comparable to deep core. So it's a much smaller detector. KM3Net will have an instrumented volume that's comparable to, to Ice Cube Gen 2. And uh, it is in the Northern Hemisphere. So it will be more sensitive to the southern sky, which is where the much of the galaxy is. So I am hopeful that KM3Net and also the Pacific Ocean Neutrino Experiment and also the Chinese are proposing something in the South China Sea called Trident. I am hopeful all of these together will be able to, you know, map, uh, image the galaxy in neutrinos, which Ice Cube has so far has had very little success with because we are more sensitive to the northern sky where much of the galaxy is not there. Um, but you can think of them as quite independent detectors. There's, there's not much in common. I mean, water is a different medium from ice. Water absorbs more photons, but scatters less. But then water is not solid so that your detectors move around. Yeah, there are a lot of issues. Uh, but in terms of science, uh, there, you can combine the data from the two and, and use them as, as a combined neutrino telescope if required. Okay, so uh, Rami is one more question. Maybe you can give a quick answer since we are just one minute past time. So uh, there were also I read claims about uh, neutrinos, ice cube detecting neutrinos from tidal reception events. You didn't mention that in your talk. Can you say one or two sentences about that? This this claim is uh, is by an independent group based on um, uh, based on some of the alerts we have sent out. Right, it's not something Ice Cube has published. We are still discussing within our collaboration what exactly the statistical significance of that is because you know the moment we send out alerts whether those alerts get followed up and so effectively in 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 frequentist terms whether a trial actually happens is is dependent on a lot of human considerations whether another observatory is choosing to follow up our alerts etc so the, the i don't think there's consensus within the collaboration on on what the statistical significance of that is but but it's 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 possible. We're not against uh, 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 other people in the community doing this sort of searches and and speculating. That um, we we plan to have an opinion on from the side of the collaboration soon. But it's uh, it'll take a little bit of time because consensus needs to be built. Okay, Gopu. Um, a very nice talk, Rami. So uh, this is about uh, KM3Net and uh, Ice Cube two working together. So essentially, that should be able to kind of, um, you know, confirm or kind of put it in firm uh, footing the SEDs, whether leptonic or hadronic, right? I mean, so that, because you get lots of, um, you know, galaxies uh, from the Southern Hemisphere uh, together with the Northern one. Um, so 
you know, the SED explanation whether the high energy cannot really dominate it by the electronic model, right? So, I mean, in some sense, the very fact that neutrinos are being produced tell us that it's there are at least some hadrons there, right? Um, I I am interested in that sort of inferences rather than these the. the so I, I read through some of the leptonic models that were published after, you know, we, sorry, the leptohadronic models, which have a parameter, which domain, like values of that parameter determine whether it's primarily leptonic or primarily hadronic. Um, and I don't know, these models are kind of, they're very reductive and they're toy, like they're basically spherical chickens in a vacuum. And I'm not sure what you learn by, I, I would, you know, I, I would say, that the fact that we have seen neutrinos from some sources such as hadrons are being accelerated there. The question of whether it is primarily mostly hadrons there, mostly leptons there, that depends on how much complexity you're willing to assign to those sources. And I don't think these sort of reductive parametric models capture them. And in fact, the, the argument I made about uh, magic's prediction that we should see one, one in a hundred, like, a factor of 100 suppressed neutrino flux that so as compared to what we saw is sort of it's the kind of pitfall of this sort of modeling of astrophysical sources right yeah, uh, i agree uh, just a one small follow up pwn um, so why are we looking at uh, in a pulsar wind nebula i thought they you know if there are neutrinos produced it's already gone right um so pulsar wind nebula uh, this was from the backup slides you uh, uh, i guess so, yeah, you uh, should kind of scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, I was looking for a backup slide. It was not meant to be a, it's something I did for my PhD. I would, I would agree with your theoretical argument that it is not well motivated, but it has also been my experience in science that looking for a search that is not theoretically well motivated and showing there is a correlation in some of the ways we make progress. We did okay. not see an excess, so nothing surprising happened. But I saw there are quite a few models predicting, for example, by a Polish guy, Bednarek, wherein you have the pulsar accelerating, uh, you know, um, cosmic rays to PV energies, and then the the, uh, the the wind nebula around it acts as a beam dump for these cosmic rays, and you get neutrinos from that. So there are all sorts of models that claim pulsar wind nebulae could produce neutrinos, but empirically we have not seen anything. So. Uh, that's that's my view of the subject. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's wind up. Uh, and uh, I think next talk is by Chandrakan Mishra. So let's thank Ramiz for a very nice talk. I'll just say one more thing about Ramiz. Uh, in addition to all this great work he's doing in neutrino astrophysics and all that, Ramiz also has a parallel career in the field of cosmology, where he is one of the few persons who has a choice part to challenge a Nobel Prize winning result. So I urge everyone to just pick his brains on everything he does. Okay, so. Thanks for your kind words. And thanks a lot for this uh, invitation. It was